COVID-19's impact on pregnancy. With so much still unknown about the coronavirus, doctors scramble to understand how it affects expectant mothers and fetuses. Gender equality in Nigeria. We're closing the worldwide gender gap being one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many Nigerian women prove that what a man can do, a woman can do also. Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Oso at Channels Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent McCory from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCory. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, the Voice of America has reduced staffing at VOA headquarters in Washington. So as you see, our broadcast looks a little different for now. We appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Uso in Lagos brings you that story. Despite the United Nations' goal of achieving gender equality worldwide by the year 2030, Nigeria seems to be lagging behind significantly in meeting this deadline. Our correspondent, Ini Jomekwa, tells us more. If we could close the gender gap of the 200 years, it could add 26% to the global GDP. This is the motivation for Goal 5 of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, which is gender equality, eliminating the root causes of the impediments to the implementation of women's rights in the private and public sectors leads one to the streets. In the transport sector, women seem to be taking their place. Riding tricycles for economic reasons used to be the preserve of the men, but these days no one can stop the women from making ends meet. Some men will see men, women doing men work, they appreciate, but some are jealousy. In the corporate world, a handful of women have made their marks. One of them was ranked the second most powerful woman in Africa as of 2015 by Forbes. She's the richest woman in Nigeria with an estimated net worth of $2.1 billion. What a man can do, a woman can do. And I don't see any reason why a woman shouldn't be able to do it. You can prove your point, you understand me, by letting them know that, listen, I've done this, I can do the next one. Many say the list could have been longer, but for the fact that more women have to deal with the home front. The United Nations says that women do 2.6 times more unpaid care and domestic work than men, while families, societies and economies depend on this work. When you're starting a family, it's very difficult to climb the corporate ladder. But once you've had your family, then you can have the best of both worlds, but you have to juggle it properly. Already a lot is being said about the need to consciously manage factors which seem to put women at a disadvantage. And the managing director of Consolidated Hallmark says that while there's no written policy in his company, as it is with many others, the consciousness is growing. We endeavor to bring in both male and female into our system. A more worrying area is the public sector. While more women have entered political positions in recent years, including through the use of quota systems, the United Nations notes that they still hold a mere 23.7% of parliamentary seats. In the current National Assembly, women occupy seven out of 109 Senate seats and only 22 out of 360 seats in the House of Representatives. Women, unfortunately, are not so economically empowered. 2030 is just about a decade away. It may sound like a long time, but considering the factors that are widening the gender gap, urgency is required on the road to gender equality in Nigeria and the world. Ini John Mekwa reporting for Channels Television News. Let's get more on this from women's rights advocate Yvonne Benson Idahosa. Nigeria is one of the countries striving to achieve gender equality by the year 2030. How would you assess our journey so far? 
Um, I think I would say that overall, right, we've come a long way, but we're definitely not where um, we should be. I think when it comes to the issue of gender inequality, of uh, women's empowerment, those remain part of the unfinished agenda of our time. I think when we look at some of the most pressing issues um, that women are facing globally, um, we see that Nigeria continues to struggle. We are consistently within the top 10 percent of countries worldwide that exhibit the highest levels of discrimination against women. And that's regardless of whether we're talking about women in governance, whether we're talking about um, women's access to justice, access to education, uh, protection from violence. Nigeria consistently ranks lower than, than we should. And to a certain extent, I think that is because um, there is some intentionality that ensures that women are disempowered in the system itself, right? And that's reflected in our laws, in our traditions, it's seen in our customs, right? And so I think until we get to the point where all of us collectively, men included, repudiate this idea of patriarchy, right? Um, because really that's what's tying everything together. Until we get to that point, I fear that we will continue to, as you say, struggle in some of these areas. But I think as an optimist, you know, I'm excited about um, the fact that in recent times, we've seen more men creating more space for women at the table, including their voices and leadership um, decisions as well. And so I think for that reason, I'm excited about what the future potentially holds for Nigeria. According to a 2018 IMF report, Nigeria suffers from widespread gender inequality and is therefore missing out on a key ingredient to economic success. How do you suggest we address this? Well, I think the reality is that gender equality has been linked to better um, development um, outcomes overall, right? We see that reflected in higher GDP, higher productivity, as well as faster economic growth overall, right? So what happens when there is a lack of women's voices and inclusions in, in, this, in these spaces is the exact opposite, right? Women have been proven to invest a larger proportion of their income back into their household, back into their communities, and into the education of their children. We know that when women's voices are included, we have a different perspective, particularly when it comes to governance um, and, and certainly in the labor force, and that results in a diversification, right, of output. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, it actually serves us, right, to ensure that women's voices are included in governance, that women's, women are economically empowered, that we have policies that take a gendered lens, particularly when it comes to the issue of education and healthcare. Um, at the end of the day, we know that these things ultimately make women better. Um, they advance women. But the truth of the matter is that the liberation of women is actually the liberation of men. It's the liberation of Nigeria as a whole. There's a school of thought which suggests that poverty is a gender issue and if poverty can be eradicated or drastically reduced in Nigeria, then it will be easy to achieve gender equality. Do you agree with this? And what's the connection between both thoughts? You know, I think I agree um, to the extent that any initiative, right, that improves the lives of women, that improves the lives of people in general, right, should be applauded. Um, but there is a link, right, between gender and poverty and economic equality, because women do tend to be lower paid. Women do tend to do more unpaid work. And women can often be undervalued, right, when it comes to the work um, that, they, that they put in in the labor force. Statistically speaking, right, globally, we know that women generally earn about 24% um, less than men. And I think at that rate, it will take us about 170 years, right, to close um, the, the gender pay gap. Um, 70, 75 percent of women in the, in the developing world in the developing world tend to work in the informal sector, right? And so we know that, that makes it harder to break out of poverty. Um, women also tend to do anywhere from two to ten times the amount of household work um, that 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 men do, which is generally unpaid, right? Um, and women, as a result of that, women tend to work longer hours, an average of four years over um, the lifetime compared uh, to men, and so. Um, we see that um, certainly um, there is a correlation, but alleviating poverty alone is not going to fix the issue. We need to start to dismantle some of the things I spoke about earlier, namely patriarchy, um, um, violence against women, and the systems that allow for those things to continue to proliferate. There seems to be some confusion as to what exactly gender equality means. 
Some people see it as women striving to dominate the men. What is your take on this? Well, I think that the term itself has been misunderstood um, on several levels and in many different ways, right? It's not about dominating men. It's not about removing men from the equation. I certainly um, have no interest um, in doing that. I think we all work collectively better together, right? But the truth of the matter is that the bodies of African women, including Nigerian women, are some of the most weaponized in the world. They're certainly some of the most legislated upon um, and certainly some of the most disempowered right, in many ways. And so for me, it's not just about speaking truth to power. And I certainly do that when I have the occasion um, and the need to, right, but it's also about empowering the voices of the seemingly powerless, right? So for, for women particularly, right, ensuring that they understood and understand who they are, the power that they bring um, to the table. And that, that generally equates right, to women having equal access to jobs, ac equal access to opportunities, um, regardless of their gender. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Ghana has started building sea defense walls at key points along the coast to stop coastal erosion and protect beaches, communities, and historical buildings. But Fishermen fear the walls will block them from pulling their nets ashore, and coastal resorts say they are harming business. Stacy Nott has the story from Cape Coast, Ghana. When Ben Iden set up a resort in the coastal town Almina, he imagined people flocking to its Golden Beach. But since the resort opened in 2009, he has spent much of his time battling rapid beach erosion which he blames on years of illegal sand mining. Authorities took steps that decreased the mining and built a rocky seawall in 2017 to stop further erosion. But now, Iden says hotel guests cannot access the water. I think that Ghana's tourism potential is really what is at risk. And when I've looked at any uh, promotion which talks about Ghana, one of the things that we always raise, apart from heritage, is our beautiful beachfronts. And I really think that we've got to start putting some effort and some investment behind ensuring, protecting and improving our beachfronts. And they could start right here. Ghana has an average erosion rate of about two metres a year, with some smaller sites seeing up to 17 metres of erosion in one year says Dr. Donatus Anuring of the University of Cape Coast Centre for Coastal Management. In response, the government is building more sea defence walls along its coast. While some of the walls allow beach access, there are concerns about the wall's impact and effectiveness. Some experts say other methods are better in the long run. We can consider some soft solution uh, like vegetation, mangroves or just nourishment with sand. We can mix solutions and we can have our beaches and even have gardens and proper recreational areas. Some communities in the central region campaigned for the sea walls, but fishermen fear they will have an impact on their livelihoods. It will disturb us and all of the time we, when we are pulling the nets, our minds go there. Because that's the work that we do here. We don't have any work. We do only the same work that we do. Ghana's Central Region Minister Kwamina Duncan worries about the impact of climate change on sea levels. He says the sea walls allow for the needs of fishermen and will protect livelihoods. I think the broad objective is to protect the townships and the hotels themselves are not far removed from where the towns are. And it cannot also be done uh, just at one point and some places are left so if that happened, then somehow the whole objective is defeated. Duncan said he hopes hotels and communities along the coast will adapt to the walls as Ghana itself must continue adapting to the changing climate. Stacey Knott for VOA News, Cape Coast. It's time now for a short break, and as we do, we'd like to remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channelsweb. Still to come, 
advocating for the rights of girls to be educated and independent. A new film titled Stop Underage Marriage in South Sudan encourages people to let go of cultural practices that keep girls out of school. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Doctors know that viruses can affect pregnant women and their developing fetuses. They are scrambling now to understand the effects of COVID-19 on pregnancies. Viewers, Kara Pearson has more. When a woman is pregnant, her immune system changes to protect her growing baby. But these changes make her more vulnerable to certain viruses, such as the flu, and increase her risk of serious health problems. So far, studies about pregnant women infected with the new coronavirus show both reassuring and alarming results. They had increased hospitalization, and they had increased ICU admission, and they had increased receipt of a mechanical ventilation when they compared them to women of the same reproductive age with COVID-19 that were not pregnant. Doctors are trying to determine if COVID-19 is more dangerous for pregnant women than getting the flu. It appears at this point that it is actually not as severe as influenza is during pregnancy. Yet the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says pregnant women who get COVID-19 and are hospitalized have higher rates of serious illnesses, are more likely to have miscarriages, deliver babies prematurely, and more likely to have stillborn babies. Other studies contradict these results. I think that we need to take a step back a little bit in that since COVID-19 is so new, we don't have all of the data that we really need to make an assessment as to what level of risk it imparts on a pregnant woman. For example, could stress be a factor? Pandemic-related hurdles to prenatal care, like lockdowns, prevented some women from getting checkups. Take a breath and go right back at it. Or even getting medical care when yeah. giving birth. Having a baby at home, but baby is not okay and we need assistance. Some women put off seeing their doctors out of fear of getting the coronavirus. Until more is known, pregnant women need to protect themselves from the coronavirus by wearing face masks, social distancing, avoiding crowds, and practicing practicing good hand hygiene. Doctors say women also need to call their physician if they notice decreased fetal movement. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. An 11-year-old girl, Emmanuel Mayaki, has gained media attention through her coding skills, which got her a teaching job at an after-school club in England. Have a look. In 2018, nine-year-old Emanuela Mayaki caught the attention of the public when she built a mobile app and website to teach ICT skills for free. I started using computers at the age of six, and um, that was when my dad bought me my first laptop. Well, I would say I'm, a, I'm an HTML and CSS type of person, not a JavaScript type of person. So um, I was really interested in coding, and like I was fascinated about the way you could create lots of things using using just minor code and like computer language. So that's when I knew that coding was for me. At the age of 10, Emanuela relocated to the UK, where her skills earned her a job at an after-school club. There she taught kids her age how to code. During the summer holidays in 2019, I, my dad and I um, found a place where I could learn Python and Java. After the Fontech experience, I went back to school. A teacher found out about my coding skill and um, they wanted me to teach a group of 10 of my classmates about coding. So we started the club and um, 10 of my classmates joined and we made pro fast progress. Now at 11 years, the ICT prodigy has improved her coding skills, aiming closer to her target to become a professional web designer and computer programmer. Though Emanuela acquired most of her skills in school, her passion pushed her on a quest to gain more knowledge. 
Speaking on her next plans, she says she hopes to align her career with machine learning. What I plan to do next is to learn C++ and C Sharp and then go into artificial intelligence, robotics and a lot more. Emanuela considers herself a privileged child, but she hopes the government can do more to enable children without such benefits like hers to learn computer skills. Um, I want to say that the government should um, put um, infrastructures in place so that children and people would be able to improve in technology. And I think that if we're able to do this as, as um, a country and if Africa is able to do this, Africa will be the next biggest tech giant in the whole world and we would be sure to um, make make name in, to make a name in the whole world. Emanuela's journey started in Edo and Lagos states in Nigeria, then to the UK. Now back in Nigeria, she's committing herself to acquiring more tech skills as she hopes to train more young people in future. A Senegalese anti-cancer group is encouraging women to get mammograms after a drop in the number of women getting screened because of coronavirus concerns, as Estelle Janjo reports from Dakar. Senegal's Anti-Cancer League says fewer women are getting breast cancer screenings because of concerns they might contract COVID-19. To boost screenings for October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the League partnered with medical centers and hospitals to give discounted prices. For those unable or scared to visit hospitals, the Pink October truck sets up in public spaces and offers free consultations. Those who come here are the ladies who have never been diagnosed with breast cancer. Among those patients, some already have abnormalities or masses that they have had for a year, but they have never done a consultation. The Anti-Cancer League says the pandemic and related restrictions are also discouraging cancer patients for getting treatment. Many have given up on their treatment because of this pandemic, but we at the League level have tried to do our best by guiding patients who did not have the income to travel by paying their transport and encouraging them to continue their treatment. The World Health Organization says over 10,500 cases of cancer are diagnosed every year in Senegal. 35% of them are cervical and breast cancers. Doctors say when detected early, the vast majority of breast cancer cases can be treated. Estelle Janjou for VOA News, Dakar. A community-based organization in South Sudan which promotes girls' education is enlightening local communities on the importance of avoiding early marriages for girls. The movie screening of Stop Underage Marriage in South Sudan hopes to educate citizens on the need to let go of cultural practices such as forcing girls to marry when they are very young and instead prioritize their education. Community members attending the screening were visibly moved by the film and its strong message. This is a good lesson for families, our communities, fathers, mothers and even the girls so that we can know how to stand up for them to get a good education which will in turn give them a better life because they are the future of our country. The film is produced by the Community Organization for Peace and Development, a community-based organization which promotes girls' education. Uh, you see some of the young girls are being impregnated. They drop out from school at the early age of in P5. Some of them they are not even uh, reaching the, the secondary school. And uh, with this, uh, I have sought and said no. UN Miss staff from the mission's Yambayo field office also attend the screening. Protection of children is a collective responsibility. The best place for a child is the home, and the next one is the school. The movie is a first in the history of the Western Equatoria to boldly and sensitively advocate for the right of every girl to be educated and be economically independent. Well, that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's television has our last word from Lagos. 
We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelTV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chain Balloon Thank you for watching. Goodbye.